new setup. I don't know what's gonna go on today, man. We haven't started yet, have we? I don't know. It's gonna just a whole new tank, man, a whole new life. Oh, hey! Alright, there we are. Alright, <laughs> awesome, man. So, what are we doing today, man? Uh, same thing we do every Monday. We give away some orders, and then we... But today we're talking about fish. Like, utilitarian fish. These fish, other fish, your fish, my fish. Right fish. on, right on. We're talking about fish today. What do we do the first thing, man? Uh, so I picked some pretty good ones today. Did you? Yeah. Uh-oh. Uh, so pretty good ones means like I mean, about 500 bucks maybe worth of giving I mean, stuff means Bob's away. gonna get mad. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, first one, man. So for those of you who know, give away stuff at the beginning of every episode. Yeah. This day we're doing it like a whole new environment though, right? New, new scenery. I think new, so. New yeah. 500 bucks, this I guess. cool. All right. So, uh, uh oh, first but, one. Well, oh, how are we giving away is the question. Like, uh, mm. preferred reefers. So. Uh, be a preferred reefer on our site. It's everywhere. It says preferred reefer join and all this other stuff. And the footer. yeah, and if you make an order in the last 30 days, or you have something in your shopping cart uh, when we go to pick, then you are in the pool to uh, get your order refunded. This time, uh, David uh, Boatman from Oregon City, Oregon, one and uh, shopping cart. Shopping cart here for 43 bucks. I, I mean, it's been a long time since we've seen a uh, full shopping cart. I, so, I, know. I don't know. There was. Uh, there's a couple in there. There's a lot of them in there. People at the sh at the Re Reef of Palooza show were telling me, I've got my car full. Completely full. <laughs> Pick me. Pick, Pick, Pick me. me. <laughs> All right. On. Uh, so uh, he got 100 milliliters of Pulse Extra Concentrate from Corland Zoo and a 24, uh, one? 24 watt Coral Plus ATI bulb. That's all he needed. One bulb. That's all he needed. I must have broke one or something. <laughs> all, right, all right, man. Well, uh, there you go, dude. So uh, those are going back to our... We're getting points for that, so you can buy it for free. Yeah. Bravo. It's all right. All right. Uh, this person actually bought it. So it was Alexander uh, Liberton. And they got 50 pounds of Reef Saver Aquarium Dry Live Rock from Marco Rocks. Nice. Start right. up a new tank. And four ounces of Stone Gray Aquastic uh, Eco Pox Putty, dude, for... Hundred and seventy dollars and zero seven seven cents. Perfect. Yeah, that was cool. The next one's a good story. All right. Well, well I'm gonna get there too. But uh, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, we spent uh, all weekend at Reef oh, yeah. Palooza, and uh, we actually talked to Mark here from uh, Marco Rocks, and he's wondering whether or not you'd buy live rock that's been pre-cured. Oh yeah. Maybe no coralline stuff on it, but it's been soaking forever in bacteria and speeds up the whole cycle process. So. I mean, it was, it's kind of sort of was options beforehand, and I think there might be a couple options like this where you can pull it, get it from like the ocean as mm -hmm. live rock, uh, uh, more so more. before, but uh, not not so much now. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one is not pulled from the ocean where there's God knows what in the ocean that could be on it. This is uh, maybe a possibility oh, from a, a tank. So over beers, we decided that, uh, and also we talked to customer service agents here that what if. Dry rock was three bucks. Mm -hmm. Rock that's been fully cycled but it doesn't have coralline algae and stuff on it is six bucks a pound. Mm -hmm. And then coralline algae, all the goodies on it, totally ready, purple, ready for the rock, is nine bucks a pound. That's free too, though. Yeah. Which one would you buy? You know, that seems about the price point where you can actually grow the stuff profitably and like uh, not go out of business. So at least for them anyway. So I was trying to help them understand like what the market might be. So if you uh, have any feedback. I'll share it with Mark. And let him know, Shoot man. What, if you would even buy that, or is it just dry buck, three bucks a pound, man? Go for it. You know, one of the things I said is, uh, why pay for uh, any of that? Just the moment you decide you want a tank, buy some of it, throw it in a bin, and uh, wait it out. By the time you actually buy all your lights and stuff, man, it'll be long since four months. Oh yeah. Uh, so uh, at three bucks a pound. All right. Cool. Uh, Bradford uh, Gemmel from uh, Tampa, Tampa, Florida. Oh wow. So he had a shopping cart first, uh, and I looked. Oh, he had a shopping cart. But he also had a recent order. The shopping cart had a Tunzi uh, uh, Auto top off in it, and not the 3155, so the less the than $100 one. one. Oh. Yeah. But then he also had this order, so I think. We're going to go with the order, man. It's bigger, order. right? Yeah. Got to go big. Yeah, of course. All right, so BioPure Frozen uh, Marine 16 uh, Mysa Shrimp, 16 ounce flat pack. Ten, got 10 of them. Holy cow. It's a, it's a bunch of frozen food. Oh, yeah, all frozen food. Yeah. Spirulina Brine Shrimp, uh, Cyclopods from Akari. Clam on the half shell, ocean plankton. I think I might know where this is going. All right, so he's got like 20, like uh, nine packs of food. Yeah. What is he doing? And flat packs too, not, flat the, packs? not the blister plaques. Okay, so uh, you said he had a story attached to it. 
Uh, well, the story was that he had a Tunzi in his cart. Oh, oh I thought it was a bigger <laughs> instead story. Instead, we were we were giving him three hundred bucks back instead of a hundred. Uh, well, uh, well, but well, I mean, he looks like he's making di- his own DIY fish food. Uh, yep. With our it does look stuff. like I thought maybe you talked to him or something about some DIY food, man. So sh- we should right reach on. out to these guys. Before right on, man. Right on. Cool. All right, so today is all about utilitarian fish, man. On Friday, we talked about uh, in the in the video. Today, you get to see uh, a few of them uh, swimming around here behind us. Tanks coming together. It's coralline algae growing all over. We got our six like test frags in there. They're all doing fine. And on Wednesday, no, yeah, Wednesday, Wednesday. Uh, both uh, who is Frank and Josh are flying up from Florida from WWC, and they're gonna fill our tank full of corals. Hopefully, cool ones. I hope uh, so. I don't know. Yeah, it'd be pretty anticlimactic I mean, if it was like a couple frogs. Do you hope? Uh, your fingers crossed for like a Walt Disney or something like that, uh, Acropora. Or yeah, the better the I names, mean, I hope man. So. I mean, yeah. I know you don't know follow names. That's okay. I know. I, 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 don't, I want man. a dozen of them. Dozen. All right. All right. <laughs> awesome, man. So uh, that's what's going on this week, and then we'll probably see like kind of a little bit of a wrap up of the whole thing next week, uh, next mm-hmm. Friday. Show the tank with some corals in it, then kind of like scale back. You know, every episode was like a half hour long. Right. Let's scale it all back to like two sentences. Do it this way. Do it this way. Do it, do it this way. And just if you wanted to have one episode you could refer to, uh, that would be it. You know, and you can skip Solid. all the debate and nonsense. Uh, you don't have to listen to me ramble for an hour. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Some people cool. like listening to rambling, though. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's coming to an end, but uh, of course we'll come back and do updates on it. I got a few things in my mind I like to share, but I, I think we'll just go to questions right away, yeah, man, and then we'll, we'll fit those guys in there. So uh, pick one out, man. Uh, let's see. Uh, list of utilitarian fish for an innovative marine Nouveau 10-gallon. That's, that's Ooh, interesting. This is a good one, man, because yeah. uh, that was one of the things that we had challenges with when I was talking to Josh, and even internally we always have mm-hmm. challenges like, What's a utilitarian fish for a tiny, tiny, tiny tank where, you know, algaes uh, or eaters or herbivores and stuff just uh, aren't real apparent? Right. So I'm going to let you take this one because I don't want any part of it. And uh, <laughs> no, I'll share my thoughts afterward. I mean, I can't say, I can't say that, uh, like, uh, there's always this uh, debate about choosing a, fo- a fish that's um, recommended gallon is such and such which is typically uh more than what you have when you're looking at these types of fish uh and some people will, there's one side of the debate that's hey you know go put go ahead and pick them up and put it if they're small and they're babies and they're tiny go ahead and pick them up put them in your small tank if you have plans or resources to give them back give them to a friend give them put them in a larger tank or something like that uh, and that's heavily debated on both sides to that's a poor practice to take on um and you know, depending on the tank size, like I've, I'm, I'm guilty. I've had uh, fish in a 40-gallon breeder tank that people say you probably shouldn't have those types of fish in a 40-gallon breeder tank. Uh, and granted, they were small too. Um, but I also personally like followed the progression uh, of I got a 65, a 60-gallon tall after that. I got 125 six-foot after that, and the fish followed me through it. So you know, not everybody makes uh, the upgrades, but. I know how deep I was getting in the hobby and I was going to make an upgrade. But uh, there are some fish out there, like some of the blennies, that uh, will eat on some uh, some algae that probably don't have as big research. Usually we're talking like tangs when we're talking like don't put a tang in a 10-gallon tank. No, uh, I don't think I'd do that. No, I wouldn't yeah. either. But there are some fish, uh, like, like some blennies, that uh, don't necessarily need like uh, you know hundreds of gallons uh, to be happy and healthy. And maybe that's a place to start. Also, like with those smaller tanks, the maintenance in general to keep algae at bay is probably a lot easier because I don't have such I a can big go thing to do. quick, man. Uh, uh, yeah, guys, but yeah, true. Um, and then you harness the power of like inverts instead. Maybe get some inverts in there earlier, or maybe a little more, or something like that. Well, there's a reason why they say smaller tanks are uh, are harder, and this is one of them, right? There's dilution. A yeah, chemistry uh, yeah. stability is one of them too, mm-hmm. but uh, also there's limited options for eating algae, true. right? And, uh, you know, some people say there's like a big debate about whether or not you can put a tang in a smaller tank. And I, nobody's going to do it in a 10 gallon tank, but, no, but when I say nobody, nobody uh, should. Uh, but, like, you put him in a 30 or 40 gallon breeder, mm-hmm. yeah, he's probably going to outgrow that tank. But, like you said, he's probably going to take two, three years to do it. And uh, if you hold on to a 40 gallon breeder, man, for two, three years, chances that you upgrade. Pretty strong. Pretty strong. And, uh, if you had success for two or three years, chances that you want to go, like go do something cooler and bigger, man, pretty right. strong. But if you don't, 
hey man, it's no big deal to take the fish out and bring them to the store and trade them for a smaller one or just give them to the store yeah. and get a new one because you uh, got your, you know, 40 bucks worth out of that yellow tank for sure. Of enjoyment? You know? yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, not just enjoyment, but like... He definitely kept your tank or your tank in order for that whole time, man. He was he's working hard, man, yeah. uh, and uh, doing his thing. So uh, you can definitely do that. And I think anybody who says otherwise is really kind of like more so on the fence of you may not do it. And that's true. That's if you're not going to follow the advice, and then that's terrible advice. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but if you follow it and say when we get big, I'm going to trade them out. There's no problem with that. So, 10 gallon tank, though, to answer a sp- question specifically. So, there's tank, uh, there's fish like a little lawnmower blenny or those types of uh, fish that eat algae. My experience is uh, they do eat algae, uh, especially when they're young, less so when they're big. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, maybe even me, maybe even less so than that if they've got a healthy feeding uh, regimen yeah. too. Like if you're constantly pumping some pellets and constantly pumping some, you know, frozen in there, why would they? Why would they eat algae? Oh, change temp or uh, color. Oh, it there. must be that time. Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, there we go. Uh, so uh, yeah, I don't know. So some of those, but I would definitely go into snails and and stuff and crabs more so at, at yeah. sizes that big because it is. Uh, oh, we change it back, bravo, dude. Uh, so uh, I, I go into those things more so, but it is a challenge, and I think you just got to be more meticulous with the small tank. Right. Uh, a tiny small tank, you probably just got to scrub it off and you know, siphon it out and whatnot more so. So there isn't a super awesome answer for that. But if you're like in a slightly bigger tank, like a 40 or you know even a 30 bio cube or something, small little bristle tooth uh, tangs like a Tamini tang oh, yeah. or whatnot is a good option. I do like you can those. You get them super super small. And when they outgrow it, man, take them out. But all day long, man, they're eating away, pulling off uh, all the algae, and they'll be the reason why you don't have any algae. All right, another question. Whoa, right, they're cool. cooking in, man. Uh, right it's a heavy, a good topic for questions. Um, uh, okay, there's a lot of people asking like uh, questions about their own specific tank too. Yep. Like what? Is there a ras that eats vermited snails? I shouldn't have said that out loud because I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, we I've, I've watched this conversation a lot, uh, you know, in the in the uh, forums and all over the place. And I mean, there's like bumblebee snails or you know thing uh, types of fish that have um, you know their teeth in the front, like say a harlequin or like a, a parrotfish or you know these ones that probably seek out some harder shell, maybe some invert type thing. For those you don't know, the vermited snails like little tubes that come out of everywhere. Oh, right? they're sharp too. Yeah, they, they, they cut the heck out of you. If you're there in the over, if there's a bunch of them in the overflow and you put your arm down there. You, you let out goo streamers yeah. and whatnot. And once you get one, you got like eight million of them. Yeah, so uh, a, a guy and I were having a, a, a conversation uh, at Reef of Palooza about it. And he wanted to try out some bumblebee snails. And uh, I was like, wow. Well, it could be, maybe, hit or miss. Some people, there's reports where I put bumblebee snails in, I had no more vermitids. And then there's reports, the same reports of, I put bumblebee snails in, and they didn't touch a thing. Uh, and that's pretty true with, uh, you know, a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of these creatures that people put in there for problems. Um, All of them. Like Aptasia. Uh, Sometimes your uh, your crabs, uh, your emo crabs will eat bubble algae. Sometimes, Sometimes they don't. don't. Sometimes your uh, <laughs> peppermint shrimp will eat Aptasia. Sometimes they don't. Uh, sometimes your uh, little tile fish will eat aptasia. Yeah. Or copper bands. Sometimes they don't. Mm. You know, who knows? You know, uh, there's some real uh, for sure things like uh, Bergia will eat aptasia, mm. you know, for sure. Mm. And in mm. every case, if something doesn't eat them. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then they have a list of predators that we usually have in the tank, too, also. Mm. Peppermint shrimps yeah, are another hit and miss one. So. I don't know. We I kind of we, we resolved on uh, in our conversation. We kind of resolved on they weren't at uh, they weren't at infestation levels, and so he has a dental pick and he'll go in there and he'll stir them up and you know cut them off. And I said, you know, when it comes down to it, I think I've I've had them in almost every tank, uh, almost every tank that I've had, and I I just resolved to that as long as I can keep them uh, as long as I can keep them under infestation levels. But mainly my concern was like. Uh, my encrusting corals and they will encrust up the shell of a verminid snail so the ones that are yeah, close to my encrusting corals I uh, just scrape those ones off and then let my uh, so as long as it's not bothering my coral I'm okay so I think there's a lot of pests you can completely avoid if you're going SPS only specifically mm. with frags because you can cut the coral tips off uh, even off the frag mount and put it in the tank and you'll probably never see a vast majority of pests mm. but 
if you're doing like anything but that, which means like you're getting a zoanthid frag that is on a rock or, you know, really almost any, any like you're adding a frog spawn that has its own kind of exposed skeletal structure right. on yeah. it. Like in almost any one of those cases, man, you're going to bring in some pests. Like uh, outside of tiny little frags that have been cut, the mm -hmm. tip only, yeah. uh, you're going to get some pests, man. Uh, I mean, even with a heavy dipping, like, regimen like we did for yeah, some of those corals. I don't think will kill vermitid. Ah, no, it's, well, they could probably hide themselves in that hard calcius, uh, calcareous yeah. shell, yeah. so. I don't know. So, okay. Nope, I, I don't got a solution for you, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just break them off, man. Uh, and uh, I don't know if that helps or not, but yeah. uh, like uh, when they bother me, man, you just get to manually remove them. Hopefully there's one in the question here about when, oh, there's a rocks question in there at the top. They look really nice. So, but hopefully you get one, if you can find one about uh, uh, when we turn the lights on, that'd be helpful. Oh, I've got one on you uh, <laughs> oh, on our right. overlay here. Somebody had asked, uh, so I pulled oh. one, a couple of them from our, um, uh, from the comments of the Facebook and comments on the YouTube video of right. our video from Friday. And yeah, that well, question we was asked and Anthony wanted to know, how long did you wait until you turn the lights on after adding the fish? All right, man. All right. So I think it was after adding the fish, turning the lights on, it was like a, a month, you know, and uh, I, I just got a couple of things to share uh, about this whole process because I think it was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, one, I hadn't done it this way before, you know, it's a little bit of that hybrid method, right? Uh, two things we did first is I added all the fish first and then we did the, like that four month cycle and then uh, didn't turn the lights on for a while, let the fish kind of get acclimated to their environment. Mm. And then uh, we turn the, the lights on. And when we turn the lights on, there's already herbivores in there. So uh, no algae issues, man. Mm. You know, like uh, algae wasn't a problem in this tank because we already had the eaters in there. Instead of trying to uh, uh, turn the lights on, watch algae grow, and then add the herbivores uh, yeah. into the tank, which yeah. is the wrong way. So it's fish first, algae never, right? <laughs> uh, otherwise it's algae first, big pain in the butt, uh, always. You know, uh, and, it, and like once the algae gets out of control, like one fish ain't gonna do it anymore, right? yeah. you know, and it just becomes a like, nasty cycle. We stop at the beginning. However, what we did get was like all kinds of uh, like uh, bacterial cycles and like cyano yeah. and you know like the tank was super cloudy with uh, bacterial blooms and stuff and you know for a moment I questioned uh, Josh's advice of just turn the lights on so in the past I'd kind of just cranked them up you know or not cranked them up ramped them up over time like you know slowly let the tank kind of figure out its yeah. uh, deal yeah and he's like dude no turn it on and let it get through you yeah. know like let it get through the whole cycle it's gonna be ugly it's gonna be brown it's gonna be red it's gonna be terrible and then it'll be fine and I'm like, yeah. All right, let's do it, man. And I'm gonna tell you that I think he's right. So. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, you look at this now, and uh, once there, we got to that point where there was one time where he said, "Go ahead and blow the rocks off," because mm -hmm. they look brown and nasty. And we did that once. Uh, mechanical filtered a bunch of that crap out, and ever since then it hasn't come back. And there's a ton of coralline algae on all oh, the, all everywhere. the rocks. You can, I mean, you can see the shot. You can probably switch over the, and maybe see it. Maybe uh, down on the. I mean, you see all these spots on the on the yep. bottom here. This all coralline, but there's purple all, all over the, the rocks, rocks and too. stuff too. Yeah. All right, so you know, uh, so what I found was uh, leave it alone, man. Let the whole thing play out. Don't treat it like uh, you need to, you know, walk around trying to solve every possible issue. Let the tank solve its own problem, man. Mm -hmm. Let the bat the different organisms battle each other out, fight it out. And then when you're like, feel ready, you know, go and blow off all of the cyano or whatever off the rock. If it comes back, let it go back. Mm -hmm. Like, let it keep f figuring it out. If you blow it off and it doesn't come back, man, you're ready. But don't just go blowing every day trying to like s solve this problem, dumping chemicals in, mm. uh, because you're probably just gonna solve more or cause more problems than yourself. Mm. And so, with the exception of, a, at some point you just run into an issue, you can choose to make uh, 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 do a, implement a solution, type, or, yeah. yeah, medication or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. hey, you know what? This tank just isn't solving its cyano problem on its own. So before we put corals in it. Let's go ahead and medicate the thing with, uh, I don't know if medication is the right word, but right. treat it with uh, uh, like, a, you like know, a red clean. slime remover, mm -hmm. a clean or mm -hmm. whatever. Solve the problem. So in this case, we actually had uh, an issue with uh, the bacterial blooms, mm -hmm. you know. I called up Josh and kind of talked to him about it. I'm like, hey, man, you know, how do you do this in, in your environment? 
And he's like, dude, it's bare bottoms. It's always bare bottoms. Man. Oh, bare yeah. bottoms always have uh, these weird issues and stuff for the first year. First year always sucks. There's always stuff happening because it's not stable. And in this case, the bacterial bloom came and we had the second batch of fish. Right. So it was stable and everything was rocking and rolling. Had the second batch of fish, downhill again. Uh, and it's just like almost like it started right over. Because the sand, man, is able to capture so much waste and then process in all that surface area of the rock right. or the sand. Mm. We don't have that here. Except for, you know, for the first year, it's going to suck because it's trying to find that equilibrium and the bacteria is growing on the rock and mm. stuff instead of the sand. And then a year from now, we won't have that problem, though. This tank will stabilize and uh, we'll be able to get uh, all of the waste and everything off the bottom. We'll go down the filtration, the filter socks, and the, uh, or the roller mat, rather, and the skimmer and stuff will remove everything. So every year past year one, way easier and yeah. a better path to success. Well, year and, one, and, and we don't have the toilet uh, in the following years of the sand. That's whole, uh, it's able to process all of that. But not everything gets out of the sand and down the overflow and into the filtration, and now we start turning into the kitty litter box. I agree. So uh, uh, Nick, uh, who also our wholesale manager here, refers it to as the overflowing kitty litter box. <laughs> and if you uh, disagree, man, go into a corner of your sand and stir it up and see exactly how much poo your sand bed is holding. Uh, it's a brown puffs start to come out of it. <laughs> so yeah, it, it is absolutely serves as that. Looks nice, you know. Uh, there are definitely times where I'll use sand because I can't help it. It looks nice. That's yeah, awesome. I'm gonna think about how I'm gonna maintain it. In this case, uh, I'm looking for the a lower maintenance possible. I, actually, less stability in the beginning, more stability in the end. Uh, a repeatable path to achieve results like uh, WWC has achieved. Uh, in a tank that doesn't need as much flow, like maybe uh, an LPS tank or something, I might still use sand. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it kind of depends. But I'm going to maintenance it a little different than I probably did in the past because mm -hmm. I agree with some of the statements here. But our approach on this one is uh, the approach on this one is is kind of different. Like the uh, other than the ULMs and some of the other tanks that we've done before is like this is purposefully uh, patient and purposefully like almost frustratingly long process to get to where we want to be mm -hmm. but two years from now we're gonna be super happy we did. If this is your first tank it'll be frustrating. Oh yeah sure. of course. Uh, if it's a, a tank that you're trying to shoot a video of every week sometimes <laughs> uh, if it's uh, your tank at your house man and this ain't your first rodeo who cares man you know just let it go on do its thing and yeah. you go through the different cycles the ULMs in my office, uh, that was my first uh, attempt at a uh, uh, bare bottom tanks and then all three of them were that. And I can tell you that all went through that bacterial bloom thing, we just left it alone. And uh, some of them went on for a couple months with that bacterial bloom in there, the water's just kind of cloudy. Hmm. And then it went away, and never came back again. And uh, about the year mark, man, I agree 100%. These tanks are super, super stable, way easier to maintain, way easier to get the uh, detritus and everything out of there, yeah. and way, way easier now. First year, harder. Yeah. No question. For sure. And so I, like, I'd be interested, you know, if we went back and Someday we'll go back and do an episode on the on the ULMs again, mm -hmm. uh, but like, you know, it was actually harder in the first year, you know, to maintain those tanks. So it was a little less, you know, choosing to go bare bottom in those tanks is probably less low maintenance for a year, way or lower maintenance at ten years, yeah. you know, or five or three or whatever. So the 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 point uh, the ultimate point here then was like, yeah, it's ultra ultra low maintenance. But it's ultra low maintenance for the future. Later, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know what? I've created a lot of Insta tanks in my life, man. Oh yeah. And, you know, <laughs> and so, you know, I was kind of stunned, man, when we failed uh, on the SPS version of the ULM. And if I have to, and we, we, man, we took out microscopes and watched, uh, looked at all the corals for pests mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. Chemistry was spot on. We did all kinds of different things, and ultimately couldn't find a reason why it didn't work out. Uh, that was my first bare bottom SPS tank, and I gotta say, I don't know if Insta Tank was the right method for a uh, bare bottom. Doesn't seem it, to be. Yeah. I, in fact, I'm gonna go on record that that was just stupid. Uh, <laughs> you know, like I just, I just, had, that was the first time. And so, well, I think it's one of the great things, man. One of the one of the guys at uh, Reef Palooza shared with me is like, hey, man, uh, one of the things I like most about the show is uh, that you guys share all your failures. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh yeah, because it keeps it a little bit more real when we're successful, right? Uh, because we talk about the stuff that really didn't go well. Like, don't do that, man. It, we tried it. It was, it was a terrible idea. Uh, yeah, don't do that. So, bare bottoms, man. It's, it's an interesting learning curve for me because uh, I've always been a sand guy prior to this. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, uh, there was fish. another piece. No, no, we'll move on. Next one. Fish, fish, fish questions. Let's see. All right. Uh, did you guys have a dino outbreak after the cycle? If so, for how long and uh, did it go away? So we didn't have a dino uh, outbreak, man, but we had a lot of cyano. You know, like I would say almost like 100% coverage. And 100% because we didn't bother to take it off. You know, mm -hmm. just, I mean, the poor people that came into sit. our uh, office must think we're terrible reapers <laughs> because it just looked terrible. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we just let it grow on there and let it be. And, you know, one day, come blow it off stays uh if it comes back tank's not ready if you blow it off and it doesn't come back it's ready to go <laughs> you know so uh we didn't run any dinos if i was gonna if i did run into those i'd do the same thing i would uh like let it ride it out find out the equilibrium i might in this case i don't got corals in here so i might black out the tank for a really prolonged period of time like weeks and not you know? worry about it yeah. when i say blackout i mean like every last uh no light's gonna find any way into this thing mm -hmm. uh and uh, I might do that. Uh, I might try like Dino X or whatever, knowing that I can do a, by, by the time the corals get in here, I can do many, many water changes to get it yeah, out, true. you know. So I, I can treat before corals get in here while I'm watching the tank cycle, uh, which is way better than trying to treat after corals are already in the tank. So yeah. that's kind of the cool part of, of the prolonged cycle. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we had a question, um, speaking of which, um, I just saw it up here. A question since we're on this cycle. Mm. We'll find it. I don't know. You, you scrolling here? Oh, can I cycle? That wasn't it. Um, Is there such a anyway. thing as yeah, cycling in your tank too long? That's the question. All yeah. right, go ahead. So because we're on the four months, so we're talking about this long, super long cycle process. Is there such thing as the too long of a cycle? I, I'd probably say no. I mean... A fish only tank, you could essentially say that, that maybe that's a, still a cycling tank. But uh, I would think that there's a, a point where, you know, there's bacteria in there. There's probably gonna, maybe there's as much bacteria as there's going to be in there. Maybe there's a point where they just stop colonizing or they've colonized everything. Uh, but I don't know when, when you consider the cycle done. Uh, in this case, we, we set the, the, the ID point of when the cycle is done by when we have you know, coralline algae growing on the rocks and our tester corals are fine. Mm -hmm. Then we said, that's the cycle done. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to go further than that, I mean, because coralline is going to happen, uh, especially if you seed it. Um, if you want to go further than that and like say, my cycle endpoint is when my rocks are completely purple. Well, then however long that takes, uh, I don't think there's an end. Yeah, it could be too long, man. Uh, you can, I think the longer the better, in fact. Yeah. So, uh, you know, let it, especially before you put coral in, you know, that is more sensitive than the fish is. Mm. Uh, you know, let it go as long as you want, man. Uh, take your time. I'm going to, like, people are going to be horribly bored with the fact that I'm going <laughs> to set up this new tank in my house and we're going to follow months. it on. Yeah. Uh, dude, it's, I bet you it's two years before it sees corals. Because uh, the first six months... Oh, you're like, talking about your personal tank? Yeah, that personal tank. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to go over there and start shooting that soon, I think. <laughs> but I bet you it's two years, two man. Two years without well, I coral. I don't know, because I, like, I want this is, I want to think about it first. Okay. Like six months. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. Like, Just absorb like where this is going to go mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. what I'm going to do. Because we're not going to like put a 100-gallon tank... You know, along the wall. No, we're gonna talking some, We're going to do something cool, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. So I want to like absorb like what's going to be really, really cool yeah. in, in this house, and you know, uh, right now we're kind of thinking about a 10 foot, like 30, 30 inches wide by like 20 inch tall or 26 inch tall or something, and then plumbed uh, either through the floor. You know, we'll probably have to jackhammer the floor up to get yeah. the plumbing over there into the fish room and then in the fish room built in wall with like a, a you know mangrove refugium thinking about a clam refugium maybe with like a mirrored look down and stuff uh, framed out like cool. you know bring something like cool in, into Pulsing the whole environment Zania, you know type oh yeah refugium. Zania refugium that was yeah. like a really cool one too man uh, we really wanted to do so I forgot about that guy. Uh, I, I think, but uh, what I like about that whole long process, now that I have some patience in this hobby, because of course I always wanted to study, I, I think every tank I, 
every tank I've started except for my last uh, one that I actually had up in my house with like the 93 cube uh, was always the same thing, rush to an instant tank. And why am I having all these problems? The 93 cube, I put rock and water in there and I just didn't care about it. I was like, uh, I'll, I'll get corals in there when I get corals in there. But I like this long process because right now, uh, if you're, if, especially if you try this like new in the hobby or you're no, you're maybe in your second year, first year setting up another tank, is right now I'm experiencing what a fish only with live rock feels like. A little bit. Yeah, and so I'm like, well, I don't have corals in here, but I have fish, and this is what it feels like, and maybe I just stop there. Maybe that's cool for me. Or maybe I, this uh, spurs me to start up another, just fish only with live rock, and then I turn this one into coral. Uh, and I can also put different types of corals in here. Maybe I can start with some LPS and softies, and then maybe put, add some sticks. But I think I like the fact that like right now uh, there's fish in here, and for some people that's enough to look at. Hmm. Uh, you know, in relation to that, uh, I want to. I got two things, man. I got to get out. Uh, so <laughs> uh, one, uh, don't let me forget. It's uh, Elliot at Marine uh, Collectors. This is a cool conversation. Oh yeah. Two uh, is uh, treating the the long cycle here, right? Mm -hmm. And so. One of the things is uh, actually up until like five days ago, this thing is still blooming bacteria, right? Oh, yeah. And uh, and like I talked to Josh about it, and I'm like, hey, what are you gonna do? He's like, dude, just leave it alone. And I'm like, hey, man, well, you guys are flying up here to put uh, corals in it. Yeah. And he's like, all right, dude, it's just like anything else. If you ran into uh, some uh, cyano, treat it. So I'm like, all right, man, we'll throw a UV sterilizer on there. And he's like, yeah, you're not gonna run it all the time, man, but you got a problem, solve it, man. So we threw a 40 watt UV on the thing, and boom! Next day, all gone. There was clear. right. Yeah. Uh, so totally, totally done. The, oh, that problem completely solved. And you know, I don't think we're gonna run it. I know we're not gonna run a UV sterilizer on all the time because I don't got a lot of room for it down underneath this tank. Right. But, like, there's nothing wrong with like identifying a problem in your cycle, and if it doesn't solve itself in the time frame that you needed it to, solve it, man, in a different way. Yeah. You know, the UV ain't gonna hurt anything in here. And it hasn't come back, too. Yeah. I, the UV was on last week, and then I think they probably, uh, I think he took it off like at the end of the week, Friday, and here we are like Monday. Yeah, it's, so I, I'm not sure when he turned it off, exactly. No. But yeah, so I mean, we'll share exactly, if, uh, definitely if it comes back, you know, or whatnot, but and it might, because it's, it's, like you said, man, it's kind of ebbs and flows in that first year. So uh, the other thing, man, the Marine Collectors guys. I don't know if you guys ever heard of Marine Collectors or Elliot or whatnot. And mm. Chad was the guy here that put me in touch with him. And, you know, he got us all these awesome fish, the Achilles and the hybrid tangs. My and favorite the fish. gem tangs and, uh, you know, the, I'm going to butcher this, man, but the Koi, is, is that how you pronounce that guy right there? The oh, parrot Chad, fish? Chad knows. I know he doesn't, actually. Nobody <laughs> can figure it out. Koi, I think, a uh, uh, parrot fish. Yeah, he gave us the Harlequin, tu Harlequin Tusk out of his, his tank. It found us that dwarf uh, golden moray eel that I love so much. The naso tank with the big streamers. Oh, that huge that naso yeah, tank yeah. with the streamers and stuff. And so a, a lot, I like a lot of you probably have ordered from your fish store or order from wherever, and you can order fish from him if you want. You can also just call him up and say, "Hey, what do you want?" Mm -hmm. And ultimately, got the service that is provided there. Like, hey, man. I want this thing from my tank. I want a utilitarian tank. Suggest some fish to me. Suggest uh, ones that are going to work together as well as a strategy of when to put them in. And uh, he just does it. Does all the work for you. You know, and goes and gets them for you. Walks that line over at, uh, at the, the wholesalers mm. in L.A. Picks out your healthy fish for you. Quarantines them for you. And then sends them to you. Now, I know like a lot of people quarantine at home, whatever. Some of you probably do it right. Some of you probably do it wrong. Mm. Some of you probably don't do it at all. <laughs> uh, and in this case, man, now I got all these nice fish in here. There is no phone call I'm going to make other than Elliot. Like, uh, zero chance. Because I got to protect the animals that are in there, some of which uh, like do really well in a proper quarantine thing, like uh, uh, the Achilles tank. But if I had anything in there that is sick, man, it would probably be a total disaster, yeah, man. really so, sensitive fish. Yeah, I mean, pay the extra or whatever it is, you know, a few bucks for a fish that's healthy mm -hmm. and uh, somebody, not just healthy, they picked it out of the bunch and then healthy also because, uh, like, they quarantined and took care of it and, like, you know, their name stand on it. So if you get a chance, you know, check out his, his website. Uh, I don't really have any affiliation or anything with him other than I was just super, super, super happy with the process. And he got us some awesome fish. <laughs> got us some awesome fish, and it's awesome the fish. only place I, I would use right now, you know. So I think it's a good time to transition, man, actually, to where maybe you got your fish uh, throughout your lifetime, man, because I'll share mine a little bit, a little bit of experience, because oh, yeah. I know everybody wants to know where to get your fish from. So. <laughs>
I mean, I got my first fish uh, from my very first tank. My first fish came, came from Petco. It was like, uh, but I was fortunate enough to like have this. Uh, there's a there's a few of these large big larger big box type stores out there that have somebody in the hobby uh, of saltwater and who knows how to take care of them and then it, they allow them to have this you know nice saltwater hobby wing and the one I had uh, down in Manhattan Kansas when I first got into the saltwater hobby uh, you know my buddy Ty he's he's got multiple hundreds and hundreds of gallons in his garage and uh, he's the one that got me into it so of course I got some fish from him. Uh, at at the pet co and uh, and then but he also helped me because uh, he also helped me like here's what you need to care for him here's what you need to watch for he helped me pick out the right the right fish like don't maybe don't look at that one because he's not he's he he told me watch for this one because he's eating uh, when, don't watch for this one let me let me hold on to him for a little while, little while so because he's really not eating and I want to make sure that he survives for you so I mean I had that that my local fish store I would call it uh, you know with some knowledge behind it who was helping me like make the right choices uh, and then of course I got some from him from his own personal tanks because yeah he, he was uh, always picking up you know people's other stuff so can't keep it in the tank anymore give it go give it to Ty so uh, I mean, that's where I first got mine, and then I actually did start to get, yeah, I got into, when I expanded to my 125, uh, there were some very specific fish that I wanted, and I could either order, try to order them through him at his store, um, or I could order online, and uh, this one I made my first online fish uh, purchase, which was Live Aquaria, mm -hmm. and I think that's about the only time I bought online for a fish. Uh, the rest of the time was my local fish store. And we had some really good ones. Like I'd drive two hours to go to Kansas City, and there was like a dozen local fish stores, or not a dozen, but about half a dozen local fish stores. And I'd, we'd go on a tour for a weekend and pick up a couple cool fish, uh, see what they had, maybe put in an order to see if somebody could keep an eye out for like, I wanted uh, seven, you know, threadfin cardinals, like blue eye cardinals. And nobody had them uh, at a store, but I, there was one store in uh, Kansas City that I, got, that I put an order in with, they're like, I'll just call you whenever, so you can come up here on a weekend. And about a month later, I got them. So I've uh, local fish stores, like usually where I get majority of my fish. So uh, where would you get them now? No, I'll share mine. Like, uh, if you're gonna buy a fish uh, today, man, uh, mm. uh, let's assume Elliot's not an option. <laughs> uh, oh, just be straight. Where would you buy? It? I mean, I'm I, if I'm looking for a very specific fish, uh, I'm probably look at uh, my local fish stores here and I'd ask them if I, they can get it because uh, I don't know I just uh, shipping always seems like a, a issue for me it's something I don't want to deal with on my own like shipping back mm -hmm. and forth but if the local fish store wants to deal with the shipping and they can get it in and stuff like that then more power to them uh, and some some LFS's do have some pretty solid quarantine you know systems in place so I'll be like okay order me the fish do your thing with it and then they go that extra mile to do that for me um, otherwise, live aquarium. Mm -hmm. All right. So for me, uh, uh, where do you think I bought my first fish? You're gonna get a kick out of this one. Uh, uh, Marine Depot Live. <laughs> uh, so yeah, okay, I bought I cool. bought a few fish uh, from Marine Depot Live. You know, this is like 18 years ago or uh -huh, something. You uh -huh. know, I don't think that even exists. They don't have anymore. it anymore. Yeah. And maybe well, I haven't seen. It. Wasn't the greatest experience but you know I bought uh, bought some stuff there uh, I, I think maybe I was, that was probably my first online shop actually I think world of fish here over uh, our fish stores where I bought probably my first fish uh, and then I started looking for rarer stuff and you know Minnesota is a you know uh, aquarium Land lock, middle you know, of the like state. we don't have a ton of aquariums here you know, fish stores so mm. uh, it's kind of hard to find really cool stuff so I, I went looking online also, I uh, shopped on Doctors Fosters. I tried. Uh, I got some really cool fish from uh, what was that guy's name, man? Uh, it was Reefer Madness. <laughs> uh, some of you might know Reefer Madness, uh, but hmm. it was uh, he was big into zoanthids and stuff at the time. He now uh, we went down and worked for Walt uh, in uh, in Fiji, and that works actually for the guys over at Worldwide. Uh, so oh yeah, uh, so. Uh, that's pretty cool. I, I is that really, Chris? Yeah, Chris, man. You got oh, me okay. super, super healthy uh, rasses and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, that was a really good option for me. That was actually my go-to for a long time. Cool. Uh, and then after that, uh, I tried Blue Zoo a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. I know somebody uh, in the comments last week's video was I like, saw I that. couldn't believe you were Blue Zoo. Well, and then there I don't know, man. I had good experience. Yeah, I mean, there was, it's, 
and then there was a follow up after that said I used Blue Zoo before and had a great time. Yeah, so I I that was one of the only ones, man. Where I don't think I've ever had uh, anything die from them, and mm-hmm. like they're not super big. You don't hear about them a whole lot, but. I just can say my experience with them was good. I don't know a single person over there or anything, but you open up the box, they look like they're well cared for, comes with like some instructions, and it hmm. actually gives you an acclimation tube with it, which oh, that's like, pretty cool. Yeah, and then like yeah. some kind of even solution to like help them acclimate. Hmm. And uh, like, it's like, hey man, that care more about the health of this fish and the aftercare of it than just getting it to you and hoping it's successful, right? Right, right, right. Uh, and you know, I'll say most of the other ones, other than that, other than uh, Reefer Madness and that, like I've had stuff die. You know, it's come sick visually, looks sick. Yeah. Uh, like you can probably shouldn't have been shipped to me. <laughs> you know, and uh, you know what? I, I'm just gonna say it how, how it is. Uh, last week, I, I mentioned somebody said like uh, shots across the bow live aquarium. Oh yeah. You know, and, like because I talked about the biggest maybe isn't the best. And man, like lots and lots of people had super awesome experience at Live Aquaria. I have, I've had mixed results like most of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I mean, I'm just gonna say it, it out loud. Like uh, they do a good service. They ship a lot of, st- especially the stuff that comes out of their facility in uh, right Wisconsin, mm-hmm. man, where, uh, you know, there's like a whole team of veterinarians up there taking care of stuff. Stuff, uh, you know, ships kind of uh, uh, other methods, a lot less so. For me, my own experience, and I'll just say, I'm going to stand by the statement that the people, if you're dealing with pets and animals, the people that move the most pets and animals, mm. maybe not always the best. And so mm. uh, definitely the best, uh, for me, I, I've seen the best offering there uh, in most cases. Like they have the most stock in, in many cases, but that uh, also, hey, Dave, the lights. Oh. <laughs> but they also, uh, you know, just... I just haven't had a ter- tremendous luck, you know, mm-hmm. so it is what it is. I know a lot of people have, and some people called me out on it, and uh, <laughs> I like to deal with smaller places that care about me as a human being and care about the pets and maybe even know who I am and have a longer, you know, relationship uh, with them. Uh, remember the last time you emailed them or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Specifically, if you call them up and ask them a question that they will tell you, oh, that's a stupid idea, don't do that. Yeah, you know, right. uh, I like to hear no more than yes mm-hmm. in, in most cases with a pet. You know? But you could also pioneer. So I like, I used to pioneer, uh, well, you could be a pioneer. And uh, so there were times where I would go to like these, you know, like the Petco store or these bigger box, mm-hmm. and I would seek out the sick fish because mm-hmm. they aren't going to... They're probably not going to make it. There's probably yeah. not as much attention. Like that one guy that knows a lot about saltwater does not work there 24-7, seven, seven days a week. So the ones that are backfilling behind him probably don't know what to do if this tank, if it, you know, if the tank's not looking very good or something. And sometimes they'll give you a discount if it's like a not so healthy looking fish. And so quarantine, like I would, yeah. I had a big tank, you know, a 55 gallon tank, and I actually uh, one of my biggest successes was an orange shoulder tank. Uh, that was looking pretty dilapidated, and I just had this 55-gallon tank and kind of just kept food in there all the time, put some Prozzi Pro in there, and eventually brought him back to health and put him in my uh, big display tank. But uh, I did get a discount on him. Uh, Would, yeah, you that's know the only quarantine system I've ever set up too, and it was I could uh, I could eat. now looking at like some of Chad's setups like quarantine systems and you know oh, yeah. all these other quarantine systems. Yeah, I could probably do better than that, but it worked. Yeah. Uh, I'll say those two fish that we got from uh, uh, the two clownfish from Reed and I in my basement now with how to start a saltwater aquarium. Yeah, uh, Fang and Sir Chompslot. They came from Petco, so uh, we just went out there for that episode, and picked up a couple clownfish for Petco, uh, and uh, they were super super cheap. And, uh, uh, you know, sadly, uh, Fang died nope. uh, like a few, uh, yeah. few months ago. Yeah. Uh, but, man, she had like That's 12 years here in captivity. Yeah. Uh, I think she did pretty good. Uh, Fang, or Sir Chomps a lot, man, still, still going. Still biting. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, and so, like, yeah, it doesn't, you can get them from anywhere, you know, to be honest, man. But, like, seeing them in person, watching them eat is the best. Go to the fish store. Yeah. It, if at this point, for me, I'm thinking big tanks. I'm taking care of them. Uh, I don't really have the, you know, I got a six month old and a two mm-hmm. and a half month or year old now. Like quarantining at home and stuff is a, like a little off the table for me. So I would gladly pay like somebody like Elliot Marine Collectors to 
you know, do that for me for a, right. a little bit. Right. Uh, you know, a little bit of extra. And, like, he probably isn't going to do it better than me as well. You know? Oh, yeah. So, you know, like, just because that's what he does for a living. And, you know, when I say that, like, I, I like to think I know a lot uh, about uh, uh, reef tanks. But, you know, there's a difference between setting up reef tanks and caring for uh, six fish and identifying them. The people that treat fish, like, every day, all day, in, in and out, are the ones that are the most skilled at identifying issues with the fish, treating them and making sure they're healthy. Yeah. So anytime that I want to know about how to treat a fish, I go to the guys here that have worked Chad. at fish stores before. <laughs> yeah, or bred them or for a living. Ch yeah, Chad does it uh, all through his house. So. Yeah. If you just own reef tanks, even though, man, I've been doing this for 18 years. Yeah. 18 years in reefing with a handful of your different tanks, so what you've had is nothing compared to one year at a fish store. Oh, yeah. You know, one year at a fish store, you've treated everything uh, known to man. You've done it successfully. You've been trained by the people uh, that have done it before you, and you'll be more and more successful. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to get Elliot out here, and he uh, is uh, tentatively telling me that he's going to fly out here. Arm. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. And... Uh, uh, help us, uh, you know, maybe do two things, man. Uh, give it a little episode on how to quarantine fish. And uh, despite what I just said earlier, he's actually he's talking about building a quarantine system in my house. Hey. Yeah, so they're like, hey, man, I can actually do it because I have a system, man, that works. Uh, you know, train somebody, somebody trained me to do it. Nice. Hey, follow these steps and you'll be successful every time. Nice. Share those steps with you guys. You can build the same thing. So uh, hopefully uh, Elliot is out there and uh, he will come through on that one because that's, that's cool. one of the most requested videos we get. Yeah, you know? for how to set up a quarantine system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, honestly, it's one of the ones that I just kind of skip over and avoid because I think there's people better in this world at, at sharing information on how to do that specific so thing. Bring them in. Let us yeah, talk let's about bring it. them in. <laughs> you know, let's bring the I people agree. that are better than me at this specific thing and let them share it with you through yeah, our channel. For sure. In fact, I think there's a whole bunch of opportunity for some of that stuff. Like, in the build in, in my house, man, like, bring in all kinds of different people, man. Yeah. Let them share uh, their ideas and their opportunities and make my tank better. <laughs> yeah, because no, it's all about his. No, no, I mean, we've been talking it, about this. more interesting. You we've know? been talking about this for a while. Like, so now this one's wrapped. The 750 is wrapping up. We've done the 160. We've done the ULM. We've done the 750. Uh, so what are we going to do next? Uh, I think people want to be in your house. People want to see yeah. the tank in your house. So those of you who don't know, uh, I moved into a, a house, uh, I don't know, a few years ago. And it was built in 1908. And I've been trying to think about how to do an aquarium in their thing. And mm. I just refused to put it in the basement because I never go down there. And if I put it upstairs, I mean, I'm not doing a 50-gallon tank. So yeah. I'm going to have to tear the floors out and put steel beams in to support it. I just I just never got past the, that stage. Mm. Now uh, I got a new house and uh, just moved my family over there. And we have still basement now. But it's a walkout, so it's a yeah. place where I'll actually spend some time down yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, maybe like some foosball or something, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, you I'll have beat. some fun down there. <laughs> and there'll be a tank down there, and it's on cement now. Right. You know, a lot, lot easier to do it. And even if I needed to make thicker cement, jackhammering up that section of the cement and making it thicker, isn't that like tearing out walls and stuff and putting in, you know, cement right. beams? Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Pretty excited. I'm pretty excited for it. Yeah, uh, right so we'll see how that comes. You want to, we've got a little 12 minutes. You want to rapid fire questions? Yeah, let's do it. All can. right. Fa fast, fast as we can. Fast as we can. Holy cow. What do I need? What do I need to do in terms of selecting of selection for win, winning items? Ah, perfect. Hey, Chuck wants to know how he can win because because we give away carts and refund uh, orders, and you got to be a preferred reefer and then have something in your cart or make a purchase in the last thirty days. You can become a preferred reefer anywhere on the site. You'll see it everywhere. And then every Monday we choose uh, a couple winners and then we give the stuff away. So be a preferred reefer, Chuck. Next, uh, easiest uh, thing to find probably in the footer. So uh, right up. once you cycle, do you need to keep feeding the cycle yes so if you're gonna like throw a bunch of pre say you want to pre-cycle inside of like a trash can or whatnot yeah. can't throw a shrimp in there and assume that shrimp's gonna do it forever you have to keep throwing shrimp in there mm -hmm. like every uh, couple weeks or something make sure that cycle keeps going yeah right you might get some nitrate and stuff in there you want to drain the tank so be it but or, or change water change your your bin but yeah. you definitely have to keep some source of ammonia you could dose like you know direct ammonia in there uh, if you wanted to but I just like a shrimp I, I know I agree it's man. simple and one of my favorite things that I saw when we after you did the cycle uh, the four month cycle thing uh, was uh, one of the guy one of the reefers one of the guys following along with the 750 XXL took a, a plastic like tub 
and put his big jumbo shrimp, shrimp in there and then riddled this thing full of holes so that way if he ever wanted to pull it out he just had to pull out the plastic tub he didn't have to chase it around the rocks yeah it was it cool idea cool. yeah yeah right on. Cool. uh how do you introduce the coralline algae so i just went from another tank and scraped it off of the overflow so i got like the reef synergy overflow mm -hmm. little thing snaps off yep. and uh you know try to pick a tank that didn't have any pests that i could see in That's it which key. is the ulm uh, softy tank yeah. you know all those corals came from uh frags that were grown at uh, WWC mm -hmm. and I didn't get any pests out of there so that tank has been up for a couple of years now and I don't see anything in it so I just took that overflow and I scraped it off into this tank and uh, it's there, you go. It. there you go so if you want to buy uh, you can go probably buy some you can go get a there's bottled versions and then you know people have a rock that's coralline yep. covered and you throw in there but so my suggestion personally is to uh, not like just get a rock and throw it in there and hope for the best mm. it's uh, scrape it off you yeah. know so the little flakies get all over the place and uh, they settle out somewhere and they create little spores and then when you see it on the uh, if you want it to spread when you see it on the glass or on the bottom or whatever scrape it off mm -hmm. you know so just keep scraping it off because it will you know spread faster that way so you really kind of most of the time want it on the rock more than anything to protect from algae and stuff growing on the rock mm -hmm. it'll always grow on the bottom and everywhere else but if you want to spread faster scrape it more often especially uh, on the back and stuff where you you know may not care if it's, yeah. uh, it's on there but yeah just find a source it doesn't have to be a lot just scrape a little bit off cool rapid fire uh, can you add more cured dry rock to an already established tank yes you can. Uh, you might get a little bit of algae on it. Uh, is it because uh, of, mainly because we think that, and this is something we have to test too. We've talked about this several times that the bone white color of the uh, of the rock of the new rock uh, reflects reflects more light and mm -hmm. makes it more prone to growing algae. It can. I don't know if it's white. Probably uh, that's my personal feeling is the white makes it more attractive. But it could just be new surfaces and whatnot. Okay. Uh, but you can also just throw it in your sump for a, you know a long time yeah. first. You yeah. know, get yeah. it used to the actual tank, and the actual environment, and then and put it in there. It up top. Uh, but it will. You know, it could grow a little bit of algae on it. You know, but if you got all your tangs and the utilitarian tang gang in there, you're probably not gonna have any problem. Yeah. All right. What else? Uh, John wants to know: Can I cycle dry rock in a brute trash uh, brute trash can in my Florida garage during the summer, or does it need to remain uh, around the tank temperatures for the sake of the bacteria. So uh, stable's probably better, man. But uh, you know what? Like if it's a, a reasonable temperature range, I don't know exactly what this bacteria lives in. But if, if it's uh, probably between 75 and 85, I bet you're probably fine. Yeah. You know. Uh, and uh, if it's uh, 102, I don't know. Ah. Uh, probably not. Uh, you know, you might even be able to look at some of the. the bacteria products that people sell yeah. and see what whatever over is and that's probably a good measurement of don't go over or under that yeah freezing true. is always really bad the colder temperatures they uh, multiply slower you know so uh, yeah but do it inside of a container you know, like I said my the best advice I can give uh, uh, forever from this point on is the moment you decide you want to tank buy the rock throw it in the bin mm. and let it go uh, you'll be more successful faster Cool. All right. Uh, drama D down towards the bottom. Are there any super small schooling fish uh, for salt similar to tetras that are reef safe? Uh, that small? Not that I've uh, not that I've seen. What are those little like, clear blue guys you like? Those. That's what I was. Yeah. The so. You know, people get the chromies, which are relatively small. They can get pretty big, though. Uh, but I think the majority of people, uh, even myself included, when you get a group of uh, an odd number, a group of chromies, uh, they start to pick each other off until there's one. And it's happened. It happened like I tried it twice with a group of with like a group of five and a group of seven, and I ended up with one. And then eventually that one didn't make it either. But I did have luck with five of the blue-eyed or thread fin cardinals. Uh, so they're like clear, they're glass uh, almost looking, they're, and they've got a blue eye that shines really bright in the blue light. It's just a really cool fish. I like it. Like they're low key, but they got this blue eye. But they shoal and they screw, school together really well. Uh, like all five of them held together, and they would feed together, and they held. They were like cr sticking around the edges of the rock. So they're not like wide open free swimmers from my experience. But they school up and they're pretty cool. I like them. My experience uh, is almost every uh, difficult to maintain fish uh, that isn't like totally obnoxiously difficult, uh, and especially the ones that are based on uh, habitat mm -hmm. or, or, or aggression was the problem, is feed the hell out of them. 
Yeah. And so you feed the hell out of them, and like maybe they just become lazy. I don't know, but uh, maybe you're removing the need to uh, fight for food or whatever. But if you feed the hell out of them, the success rates go way up with all those kinds of fish. Mm. And so a part of the WWC method is uh, to feed the hell out of them. So <laughs> uh, they tend to do better in those types of environments, you know. And in their tanks, they got things that normally don't do well, yeah. like uh, the cleaner wrasses and yeah, stuff like yeah. that which are just in their little little piggies, man. They're so fat. So, uh, in fact, all of them, man, Weight Watchers, I think. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, like uh, a lot of those things. So some of the fish that you talked about, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like uh, some of the chromis and stuff like that, they do tend to dwindle. But if you keep them well fed, man, my experience is uh, most of them will make it. And they're super cool because they kind of school around inside of the acros and stuff. Yep. And they, poof out all together and come back in. So those are cool. Cool. Here's a good one. T.O.'s Aquariums uh, wants to know where's the episode of making fish food with the exact ingredients. Okay. That's coming up pretty soon, man. So I got one little holdout here and that's that Zach is actually sourcing some of the ingredients uh, and we'll have them probably under like uh, in here in not too long. Mm -hmm. So you can actually pick them up when we're doing it. It doesn't make a lot of sense to tell you how to do it and then not be able to offer tell it you to you. Get it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, I think the hold up on that is maybe like, uh, I don't know, four-ish weeks or so. And uh, once we do it, uh, I think we're going to give you two recipes. Like one, which is just uh, fish food. And then two, like fish food is right now. Like Yeah, because I wouldn't feed like reef chili in here. No, or I yeah, wouldn't no feed way. like uh, any type of, you know, powder type thing that the fish can't eat. Yep. Why? Because uh, there's no, there's not enough, there's not a small enough mouth right now. No and not enough acids, of none of that yeah. kind of stuff. So like we're gonna fish feed just chunks of uh, sea material, maybe seaweed mm -hmm. and stuff too. But like uh, there's no 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 powders, amino acids, and whatever. Mm -hmm. and then we'll also make a like a reef mix. Like hey, this thing is full of robust corals and just soaking up nutrients. You can't even like keep a nitrate level despite your desire. Yeah, <laughs> and so boom, man. Now we'll add all those foods in there that uh, yeah. provide a holistic approach to nutrition. Cool. Uh, so maybe four five weeks. Yeah. Uh, here we go. Um, those rocks look really nice. What kind are they? Yeah, so for me, uh, 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 these are my favorite at this point. So they're the shelf rocks from, from Marco Rock. Mm -hmm. There's two, a, and there's a foundation rock in there. So the foundation down here, uh, you can't see. Can you tell, pull that thing off? Oh, yeah, maybe the, I can. There you go. So the foundation here, you can see, is actually cut and uh, is flat. Flat bottom. So I uh, maybe kind of see there in the back, you can, actually. Yeah, you can actually see back right behind. There. Yeah. Uh, so it's flat and it's cut, so it creates a super like solid, 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 flat, seamless look with the bottom. Mm -hmm. Almost looks like it's coming out of the black depth, right? Yeah. And then the shelf pieces are stacked on top of it, and in the shelf pieces, they create that kind of like 3D look. And if you go back and look at the actual build episode, uh, and I think there's actually a video of Joe doing the aquascape on, uh, on, on YouTube, something. so you can check out that too. So Joe over at Unique Corals, the guy does the Triton and works with Marco and stuff too, man, the guy's busy. Uh, he helped us out, came out here and aquascaped the tank. So it's that shelf stuff, it is definitely more expensive. And if you look at it, you're like, oh man, that's a lot more expensive. Yeah. That's because they don't find the pieces that way, they're machining them. Yeah. So they're getting big pieces of rock and they're machining them into the pieces, uh, handcrafting it to make it look the way that it does. So it definitely has man hours and cost to associate with it. My favorite part about this rock is the surface area for SPS. Being a stick yep. head, like uh, it's with that some you know with that Pukani rock and some of those round, more round rocks, it's so hard to find places to put sticks. Mm -hmm. And when you're adding more sticks, it's like, okay, now where do I put them? Because I know they're going to branch out and I know they're going to grow these bigger colonies, but I have no room for them here. I can, I've got tons of room, tons of flat surface for them. To well, go. well, one of the other things you'll notice is uh, there's not a whole lot of rock over the 50% mark in the tank. Not true. Yeah. Right? Because like when you're building a tank, you're like, oh man, I want to fill it with rock up to the top so it looks like a nice aquascape. Mm. But when you actually grow corals out, like I want the corals to be right about here and that's, I don't want them all the way up the top coming out the top. And so I need to account for six inches of growth. And so I will do it, you know, not as well or not to have it look as nice day one, knowing where this is going. Yeah. Right. True. And so that's a mistake that tons and tons and tons and tons of reefers make on their first tank or even 10th. Mm -hmm. uh, it, don't build the aquascape for what it looks nice now. Build it for what's going to look like nice way down the road. 
and you fudge it a little bit, throw one uh, in the back up here. It's a little higher to give it a little depth, but that is not the primary thing. You probably can't see it in this photo or this video as much, but there's an actual slope of tears that come off that back one. Yeah. Uh, we, we saw it from the side, you'd mm -hmm. probably be able to see. Cool. All right, next one. Couple more. Oh, yeah, a few more. All right. Man, there's so many uh, questions here. Scroll down a little bit, Drew Long. Is there a formula or general rule for how many fish you can have in a given tank size? Uh, 90 gallon, and it does go up with the amount of size and type and coral stocked. Uh, I think a lot what of is, people... Like one inch of fish per... For freshwater? Or, yeah. For freshwater, I think a lot of people go with like an inch per gallon rule or something like I that. I don't know. Nonsense. Um, no, I, the biggest thing I look for is like when I was so I was planning on my 125 gallon and another you know these online resources. Uh, I went to like you know Live Aquaria and looked at uh, the fish that I wanted and whether or not it was in stock. I was like, oh that fish looks cool. Let me go research it. And I research it and it says eh, not for a tank um, less than 300 gallons. And then I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm not going to have that. Definitely so that. I'm probably I mean, generally not those put things that are in. fudged too. So if it says 60, it's probably 100. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. If it says 300, it's probably six. <laughs> yeah, and then what? So, so does that mean that means that if I have a 100 gallon tank, I can shove as many fish as I want to in that 100 gallon tank as long as they're supposed to be in a 100 gallon tank? Uh, no. Well, uh, I mean, my filtration uh, has a factor in it. Uh, my biological filtration. Um, you know just the health of the fish like the territory of the fish and the types of fish that you're mixing together and like having this thing completely stocked to where they can't even swim because they're bumping elbows with each other they're probably not going to be happy no so so there's a couple exceptions to that rule like uh, if you're going to have don't have for the most part don't have two tanks have five you know mm. uh, they kind of like disperse the aggression up don't ever add one tang and then another one later on oh yeah you especially know? the spe uh, similar species yeah man they will you know, mess each other up mm. man so i even went as far as i wanted a purple and a yellow tang and i already had a yellow i took the yellow guy out put him down in my frag taints for six months down there mm. and i put the purple in for six months when i put the yellow back in yellow remembered man this is my home get the hell out and mm. chase that poor little guy uh, around until he was so scared he just sat in the corner man Jeez. and yeah. it was so crazy man like after two days i went and put uh, the net in and he swam right in the net <laughs> like, how am I going to get this guy out? I couldn't believe how fast it went, man. And like, so, yeah, they actually wanted out of the tank. So the best thing you can do is have a plan yeah. of how you're going to introduce them and then introduce, like, groups of them at a time. Mm. So, like, if you want to have a, a whole bunch of tanks, man, make a, like, intelligent approach to it. Add, uh, you know, three and then mm. add three or four more. And so when they add, it's kind of like then all the aggression doesn't go after one of them, kind of disperses it out. And add the most aggressive species at the end, mm. uh, like the Achilles and blue powder blues and stuff like that, put those guys at the end. Mm. And, uh, and better yet, uh, hopefully man, your store is gonna be able to give you so advice. Yeah, that's, <coughs> that, that's the point I was gonna make, is that, uh, so also in researching like my 100 gallon tank, I went and looked at like forums and I went and looked at these places and l searched for my size of tank and then went and looked at other people's tanks, looked, you know, paid attention to the fish. A lot of times in the forums people have already asked what fish they have in there uh, and if it's a uh, mature, you know, tank that is obviously looks successful, then that's one that I'm going to point at and say like, well, if he can keep those fish or if they, if they can keep those fish, I could probably keep the same ones and man, which ones do I like, which ones do I don't like. And then on top of that, like building your fish stocking list and putting it out there for, you know, people with tons yeah. of experience to like uh, critique. Um, you know, you're going to get a variety of opinions. Um, so, yeah, you know, a couple, couple of haters, probably yeah, mixed, I mean, but ignore them. But the, a majority of people will give you some pretty good advice. Mm -hmm. So on, on yeah, it's probably do this one. And if you're going to do this one, do this and this and this. So first. like I uh, post that kind of stuff on Reef to Reef or mm -hmm. our uh, hashtag Aspires TV Facebook group. Yeah. You know, like I said, there's always some Tang uh, police people and stuff in there. But there's actually more people that are willing to be helpful. So focus mm -hmm. on those guys. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'll just give a, a last one too, man. Or you can work with somebody that, like I'm sure there's other people.
people than Elliot, uh, mm-hmm. but it was just such a pleasure for me. You say, hey man, this is my tank, this is what I want, help me build out a stocking list. Then he divides it up into you know, the ship dates uh, for the types of fish. And it won't be like 100% perfect, it's a little bit based on availability and, and whatnot, and he won't send you a sick one if it doesn't look good, you mm-hmm. know? So but it won't be 100%. But like it'll be the right fish and it'll be healthy and you can help build you a plan from a, a, an expert instead of trying to figure it all out on your own True. and uh, tell you the pitfalls. In fact, uh, a lot of people don't have success with uh, fish like uh, the powder blues and powder browns right. and the Achilles. If you go to his website, there's a little link on the top uh, uh, about uh, cantharis tanks, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then you can uh, read about how you actually do it because it, it isn't rocket science. There's just a way to do it right. that works, and there's a whole lot of ways that don't, you know, with fish like this. So follow the rules, uh, and even if you don't buy it from them, then you can check it out and share his information with somebody else, and hopefully help people be successful. Yeah. Uh, are you fine there, or Dave? You yeah, showing it? Throw them up there. All right, yeah, throw it up, Dave. So. Uh, there you go. So uh, marine collectors, and then up at the top, there's like a little tips and tricks thing. Uh, and I don't know if you can find it. And a success with acanthus tangs down there. So uh, you know, you can just read exactly uh, how to do it. So probably some aggression stuff in there. There's quarantine stuff in there. And uh, uh, if I was him to suggest any bit of information, this is what I go after. Cool. Uh, you say acanthus. I say. What is it? No, you, you know, that's probably right. Oh. How do you say it? Acanthurus. I think I'm right. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm sure somebody out there is going to tell us for sure. Uh, and let's answer a couple more real quick. There's so many questions here. I know it's after four, but like, okay. hey, man, let's, call, no, let's, let's roll on. Is there any way to keep the sand bed from turning brown? Junk only, junk only. Wants to know. I, I think you can uh, siphon it, man. So the best way is get a siphon, uh, go into a bin, and just squeeze it. You know, mm. so when you turn it over and you see all the brown stuff, I want the brown to go down the tube, not mm. into the water, right? Yeah. So like, if I just go stir it up, it's just gonna go into the water, and it's disgusting. Mm-hmm. So I want to stir it up and get it out. Now, some people say if it's over like uh, four inches or three inches or something, you don't want to stir it up. Oh, there's the all kinds of bad uh, stuff in yeah. there, and it's probably true. That's why I would not have a four, five, six inch sand bed for myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, one of the people at uh, the show asked, like, I really want to have a two inch sand bed. And like, yeah, you can do that. The problem is that somewhere it's going to be six. You know, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I prefer to have uh, one inch and one inch. For the most part, I would probably, wherever it like piles up and goes to six inches or four, I might leave it alone because I tend mm-hmm. to also believe there is some stuff in there building up. And if I did, I'd be real aggressive about s- slowly, you know, stirring it up and making sure almost everything possible goes mm-hmm. down that tube instead of into the tank. Yeah, you know, uh, the WWC, the way they do it, because they have that 293 and it's got really fine sand oh, on yeah. it. And it's all, and they say it's brown almost every day. It's brown all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of, of course, and now it's a display tank and there's people in their store all the time. So there's somebody in there that walks by and we'll just siphon uh, siphon out the, the brown off the top of the sand, a light enough siphon where it doesn't suck the sand out, but it does get the brown out and then they, t- they take off. So that's a good point, man, because sometimes you see uh, like on, on internet photos and stuff, somebody's tank looks super pristine. Ah, yeah. And you're like, oh, what did How you do take you keep, keep the sand like, so pristine? It looks that way because they took care of it. I j- <laughs> and I just <laughs> siphoned it before I took the picture. Okay. Yeah, it's like you clean your house when company comes. Yeah. You yeah, know? yeah. Uh, so, uh, not always. Some people just get lucky too. The sand's always clean. I definitely had tanks like that where the, mm-hmm. I've had tanks where the glass actually doesn't get dirty for mm-hmm. weeks, man. So, mm-hmm. specific, those tend to be the ones where we're running like GFO and stuff in it though, mm-hmm. where it's yeah, like true. an inhibitor to true, it. True. But, uh, yeah, man, there are a whole variety of ways. And I, I would clean the sand. Next one? Cool. Uh, is this, are starfish and sea urchins good for anything? Oh. Uh, I, I say yes, because I've seen urchins, like, mow down some algae before. I've also seen urchins mow down some coralline algae before. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, my purple got it too, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Some, uh, I do believe in urchins, and we do keep a few of them around here. It's cool to see, like, the long spine urchins, and when Chad gives him a haircut, um, because mm. they get really long. What do you mean? Um... But uh, he breeds them too, man. Yeah, those and pincushions, yeah. uh, tons of them, uh, and they grow super fast. 
Yeah. Uh, starfish. I've had the, the linkia starfish, the blue and the orange. I've had the sand sifting starfish. And I'm not sure if the sand sifter does, like, you know, people say, that's oh, a good way to keep your sand bed clean. I don't know if I agree with that because, you know, there's our, there are, like, you know, di- diamond gobies or there are these gobies that will actually churn the sand over a whole bunch. And then the sand sifter starfish might pop up here. And then he might disappear for a few days. And then he might pop up here and he might disappear. As a whole, these things kind of build together. But like a sand, uh, one sand sifting starfish, you make zero impact on the overall. They're just uh, cool. The tank. Yeah, they're cool though. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, I will say those urchins, man, do a really good job in algae. But I hate them uh, because <laughs> they push corals all over the place. Yeah, they yeah. grab the onto them, pull them around. Mm. They just kind of bulldoze stuff around. Uh, and uh, You have a zoa colony growing on the back of your pincushion. Yeah, exactly, all the man. Time. I, I got tired. of I don't use uh, those anymore. And it's not because they don't work. They absolutely do work. Uh, and probably better than almost any other inver- invert in there at eating algae. Yeah. Uh, other than, like, you know, sea hairs and stuff like that. But uh, in my opinion, uh, they are uh, a bigger pain in the butt than anything. Cool. Right. Mm, uh, a couple more. Uh, I mean, two more, then we'll call it a day. All right. All right. Uh, wouldn't be the best time to add copepods. Can you add it right in the cycling, or should I wait? As long as there's waste in there somewhere. So I guess probably the best time to add copepods would be like. You know, as I'm feeding towards the, the end of the, um, you know, when you add the fish, man. Okay. Now there's a food source in there. Yeah. Uh, but I gotta be honest, man. They're like, gonna appear anyway. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to boost it for some reason. Great, but like they're gonna come out of almost like thin air. Or, like I, I've seen like people it. autoclave tanks and they come uh, somehow find their way into the tank. So hmm. I don't know if they come with the fish or they. You know, very well could be come yeah. with the maybe their spores and salt mixes. I, who knows? Man. I don't know where they. I don't know where they come from. But I've never seen a tank without coke pots in my whole life. Mm. So they'll come on a coral. They'll come on something. Uh, you could definitely see them if you want. There's definitely people willing to sell them to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I mean, as many as you want. You know? oh, yeah. uh, we've, we've added a bunch of them. To, yeah, to the tanks. That when they're provided to me for free, man, I will dump them in for sure. Yeah. Uh, will I buy them? Would I? Is there any scenario where I buy copepods, man? Uh, I feel like initially I would. Uh, personally, I, I can. I'll, I'll get a jar, and in after three months of the cycle, or four, maybe four months of a cycle, when it doesn't hurt, it probably doesn't cost me an arm and a leg, and then toss them in there. Yeah. Okay, so if I was already like at a place like LG Bar, and I was buying some snails and some. Uh, uh, Catomorpha and some other stuff, and you know, like just throw a thing for in there. four bucks. There was like an extra like bonus kit that had some coke pods in it. Okay, I've wasted four dollars on dumber things. Uh, <laughs> would I go um, t- to buy them? Never in a million years. Okay, uh, and like point. and continually buy them just to replenish this population that you think is dwindling for some reason. Yeah, probably uh, not. never. Uh. Man. Ever. Okay. Like not a chance. All right. uh, because they're they're just they're gonna multiply to the point that like as based on the food source, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, you'd be better off like grabbing a piece of fish and jamming it deep in some of the holes, and they'll multiply like hell. Hmm. So uh, and then buying them, I, I don't know. Like yeah. how many can really be in there? <laughs> hey, I don't know. Nah, it's just not my thing. Uh, what else we got here? Uh, do peppermint shrimp eat zoas or other corals? My experience, no, but I did talk to a guy at Reef of Palooza. We were talking about this because we put in a bunch of peppermint shrimps in the 160. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was telling me the story about it in his tank. Like, yeah, no, I had a bunch of Aptasia. I threw in a bunch of, like, two handfuls, a couple dozen uh, peppermints in there. They absolutely wiped it away. But then I started noticing some pick at the polyps of my you know, my SPS and stuff. And I said, I've had plenty of peppermint shrimps in my SPS tanks and haven't seen them pick at something like that before. I've seen my cleaner shrimp kind of like go at when I was target feeding like my acans or something. And my cleaner shrimp would run over there and pull it out of the acans uh, tentacle or feeders. Mm-hmm. But uh, I haven't seen peppermint shrimps eat corals. So... I haven't either, uh, but what I have seen is peppermints eat detritus and dead tissue and stuff mm. off of coral. So it may look like they're killing them. Oh yeah. Uh, but uh, they tend to be eating like decaying tissue. That doesn't mean that that can't happen because anything can get a taste for anything in the tank, mm. uh, and it's just never. I've never seen it happen in any of my tanks where the uh, uh, peppermint uh, shrimp went off for anything I didn't want them to, mm. uh, and uh, uh, could happen. 
but I'd never seen it. And it's a lot of times it, it just looks like they're going after that kind of thing. Yeah. Like a lot of times it looks like your crabs are eating your snails, but often the snail died and they're eating the snail. Yeah. It's already dead. Yeah. You know? Doesn't mean that if they're hungry enough, man, they will go and chase down that snail and, and often will kill it. But. True. All right, one more. That's it. Okay. Okay. Is that you said one more? Yep. Okay. Well, there's two that we can really go quick. All right. Uh, Ed down at the very bottom. What's Elliot's site? It's MarineCollectors.com. Check it out. Uh, Lewis, uh, are you guys still taking the sand out of the bottom of the BRS 160? Yeah, there is still some in there. Yeah, we just gotta. I think it's to. It's, it's some like of that sand that turns into like, um, like chunks. Um, it's solidified. Yeah, right and now, you like just rock. have to like scoop it out and so pull it out. We got almost it. all the sand out of there that uh, is loose. Yeah. Yep. All cool. right. I mean, how many can we burn through here quick? All right. Have you guys experienced uh, algae that is toxic to fish? Uh, he lost a couple fish in, in the same time period. Wants to know if it was the algae. I've heard people say that like bryopsis is mm. is uh, uh, toxic to some fish, um, and in some probably why they don't eat it. To oh, be yeah. Well, yeah, and then I um, mean when you treat the tank, and then uh, it ends up no, dying and flying over, yeah, flying off, and maybe. stuff, man, for sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, can you discuss cleanup crew in the tanks in the sand versus bare bottom uh, amounts of critters and types? So in the sand, I I I, I only buy the sand sifter and coral or uh, sand sifters and, until the sand has been you know has enough food in there for them. So mm -hmm. I won't buy them until they are, the sand's been in there for a year mm -hmm. or whatnot. Otherwise it's trochus, snails, hermit crabs, and that's really o about it. The only snail we buy now for the purpose of cleanup crew is, is trochus, trochus snail. Yeah. They do a really good job. They go after a variety Flip of themselves stuff. over is probably the biggest so. biggest thing, so. Once in a while I go with those Nisarius snails just because they're fun. Yeah. Uh, I go eating around little, little tubes. <laughs> good so. for the sand too. Yeah. Uh, uh, how long can you keep a small tank in a 20 gallon AIO before it outgrows it? That's a tough question. Uh, I don't know if I would put it in a 20 gallon, man. That's super small. But if you did, I'd have to go find one at a fish store and it would have to be the size of like, like, like this a, big, man. Yeah. And there's a few you know, of them out there, but typically if in my, like I've tried they to get pretty little fast ones. A small, that small size too, yeah. man. So you could do it. I uh, just be, be knowing you're going to have to definitely going to be changing out in a year have a plan uh yeah and you know every year and do it man switch it out and go get a new one yeah uh, but i in, in fact I, I wouldn't put a tang in a 20 gallon new hole personally i wouldn't i'm not tang police i just wouldn't do that I mean, right uh, we already asked the one above that we already answered the one above that so have you guys had any luck with a harlequin shrimp uh and i've got some small starfish i hear they eat so he's probably got astrina starfish and he wants to know if harlequins will help mm -hmm. uh from watching chad's harlequins they'll absolutely will help and he used to like feed them he used to buy feeder starfish just to mm -hmm. keep them alive uh, it was always something that was kind of cool to watch. Some people, it's like, ah, I don't want to watch another creature eat another creature alive. Um, so it depends on your flavor. Uh, I, you know, they're this super cool thing, man. And, like, you know, they're dragging their food around with them all over. This poor animal's getting eaten. I mean, it's totally natural, and it's really cool. And Personally, it doesn't bother me, but I, you know. I'm on the edge, man. Yeah. I don't know. It's like, I also don't want to feed... I just don't, I don't know, feeding live animals, the other live, uh, live animals, uh, parts of it are cool, you watch nature, parts of it, like, I don't want to keep buying starfish and watch them get tortured every True. day. True. Cool. Uh, uh, how would you recommend going about adding a yellow tang and or ras to a 90 gallon that's all, with an already large, uh, a blue dominant hippo blue hippo tang and large and sailfin? Sailfin tang. Uh, I might add, like, a few yellow tangs is what I'd probably do. So. In a 90 gallon, you gotta get them pretty small. Uh, I bet you could add three of them in there mm -hmm. uh, without problem. Uh, I might wanna hit Ellie up. I think Elliot told me he might stop in today uh, be in, and answer some questions and stuff. So maybe he's answering here for you. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I might add three of them at a time uh, instead of just the one. And they're cool too. When when you get them, you know, a, a few of them at a time, they tend to like have a herd mentality. And so they all uh, like, go eat together yeah you know and they all kind of eat the same place and stuff uh, and it's kind of more fun than one my experience with zebra soma is like the sailfin mm -hmm. is that like, especially if I had a sailfin that's just aggressive at anything I put in even if it wasn't a, a tang or a similar type of species mm -hmm. you know uh, the acanthus or anything like that but uh, I, I like that idea Add add more so it, uh, they get a gang up and he can't mm -hmm. pick he can't Pick one out. I Actually, uh, another option too, man, that Josh was talking about, and we didn't get to today. But uh, in addition to that, go add a whole bunch of uh, antheas or something with it at the same time. 
And mm. so, like, uh, he says that a lot of those, like, uh, schooling fish or just small little fish that are swimming all over the place, they will break up the aggression just due to, the, like, the distraction that's going uh, on all over the place. Okay. So it isn't necessarily just having a bunch of different uh, tangs at the same time. You have other fish at the same time, and it just kind of disrupts everything, mm. especially if they're types of fish that weren't normally in there. So cool. uh, go ahead and uh, consider that as an option. Is there one left? Uh, it's two more. Quick. Ah, all right. uh, what's your opinion on Molly Millers? And I think of them as the best ugly fish you can own, uh, Harkins Aquatics. Uh, we have, I think, uh, I don't know if it's Chad or Chad and Tyler, but they both have done, I think one of them or both of them have done the Molly Millers in the saltwater tank. Okay. Best ugly fish you can get for a saltwater tank? I don't know. It depends if you think I they're mean, pretty. Those are the Molly Millers right there, right? Uh, Chad. Yeah. Chad, put those guys in here right here, man. So we got Molly Millers right here. We got a bunch of them actually. <laughs> they're sc scooting around. So. What do you think? I don't know, man. Uh, they are not like the most attractive fish, but they're running around eating all day. So <laughs> I've heard they even go after Aptasia and stuff. I haven't seen it, but yeah, yeah. Hobson. Last one. one. Uh, I want to get a mandarin goby, but I don't have enough room in my sump to put a refugium or grow pods or grow. How can I sustain pods in my tank? to eat. I don't know how big your tank is, but uh, you know, I was really, really successful with a 90 gallon and he was super fat. Mm. And what I did is I hung a, a hang in the back refugium on the back. Mm. So I fill it up with uh, some Kato, throw a little light on the top and you can feed, uh, you know, uh, the uh, pods to the tank and mm. has a safe area for them. I really like these things, uh, pod hotels. Uh, there's, we, we, I think we have a couple on the site too. Okay. Um, uh, not that they're going to be the, the the solution, but it gives uh, a place for pods to like grow safely, or or you know, um, can't get into the middle of them. So yeah, so call I, I would definitely find if you've got a, a smaller tank, I would definitely find a way to incorporate a, the pods in a healthy manner. And people call the mandarin super hard to maintain fish. I'd call it the easiest fish out there because once you maintain a stable source of pods. It's the only fish that, if I disappeared for a year, will still be alive. Hmm. Uh, it will wander around and just eat everything naturally in the whole tank. All right, cool. lights that are changing it. color again here, it looks like, so maybe that's the time uh, <laughs> I'll let you know. So today was super awesome. Again, uh, thanks for Elliot for some fish here that helped us out and some information. Thanks uh, to Josh. Uh, uh, at the and uh, the whole WWC team. Uh, actually, big thanks. We're kind of nearing the end of this whole thing, so big thanks also to uh, uh, you know the leadership over there with uh, Ryan, Vic, and Lou uh, yeah. for you know sharing all kinds kind of information with us. I will say that uh, almost every hobby man people tend to hoard knowledge and keep it for themselves, uh, and these guys are sharing all kinds of knowledge with everybody, man. And so big, big, big thank you to them because if we can all be more successful. Uh, we'll grow faster and we'll learn more together yeah watch our uh, instagram and facebook because uh wednesday when they these guys come to uh put corals in this tank mm. i'm gonna be snapping all kinds of pictures of it and we might even uh, do a little instagram or facebook live from the cell phone uh, as they do it and see if we can get an inside uh, so inside look at what it what were you so. hoping for again like wedding cake or something or uh like uh, the type of coral said earlier. <laughs> uh, I mean, all kinds of crazy ones. Man. There's all kinds uh, of, the, the names of them are crazy. I, I just know, wanted I just cool don't pay attention ones. to the name. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, you don't have to. The rest of us do it for you. I know. Well, I'm just not into it. Uh, I, I, I like the animals in the tank rather than name it for a birthday cake. So, uh, <laughs> the birthday cake coral. All right. All right. Well, we'll see you later. All right, guys. Take care.